What's up, YouTube? Today we're just gonna get right to the point, try and figure out a little bit more info about Vim.Schedule. You may have seen it before in various plugins, or it feels like you have to use it, it seems like at somewhat random times, and it produces, you know, not exactly sure why you're using it or when you have to use it, so hopefully this video will quickly and shortly explain what it does and why you would wanna use it. So, let's do a quick example. Let's say we've got ourselves uh, just some Lua file. We're just going to execute this Lua file. Let's say like uh, schedule uh, demo.lua, something like this. So the first thing we could do is something like print uh, starting, right? So it's like, yeah, you guys know what's going to happen here. That's going to execute. It's going to show the message starting. Okay, nothing, nothing crazy there. Now we can say something like this, like uh, scheduling number one. And then let's say something like done you know and inside of here we'll do what you what you may have seen before something like this and say uh, print sketch uh, I don't know let's just say message number one right so that's kind of obvious uh, which one is which so when you're seeing this originally it's not super obvious necessarily what should happen so what's going to happen is if we run this and we can check our messages we see that we get starting scheduling and then we see done and then eventually we see this message. Why is that? Why is that? Well, that's because vim.schedule basically says, hey, please run this function the next time the event loop has some availability to run this function. So we could just literally copy this whole thing here and let's change all of these ones to two. Uh, let's say done two and done one here just to make it kind of obvious, right? So what's gonna happen now? We're gonna see starting, scheduling one, done one, and then what do you think? Take a second, consider. Okay, hopefully you've considered. Uh, then what we should see next is a scheduling number two and then a done number two because we're going to be executing this file top to bottom. And then when the event loop has time to process these functions, which will be after sort of we've completed this file, then it will be able to print message one and then print message two, right? So if we execute this and we look at our messages again, You'll see that we see starting and then scheduling number one done number one scheduling number two done number two message number one message number two what happens if we would do something like this vim.schedule function print whoa scheduling in a scheduled function yes that's possible so what's this going to be doing it's going to run like just like we did before when it gets to message one now it's going to schedule this print. So consider again for yourself, where do you think it's going to show up? It's going to show up after message two, right? Because this actually hasn't had time to, uh, it gets added later to the event loop. And I'm gonna draw a picture in a second uh, to show that. But so if we do this, right, we see we get message one and then message two and then this message. So you may be like, okay, how is this happening, right? How is this happening? So let's go ahead and let's draw ourselves a little picture here. Uh, that's just from earlier today on stream. So what's happening? Uh, maybe we can do it like this so that we can look at both of these right at the same time. All right, so what happens is we're sort of starting off with this starting message, okay? And then we're gonna go down the file and then eventually we'll print the uh, done number two, right? And this sort of all happens in one block. And when we get to the first schedule, what that does is you could imagine basically like a list or a queue of functions that need to get executed later on the event loop. So basically we schedule the first one and we can imagine we've got like a little container over here of functions to execute. And we get this message number one and it goes inside of this uh, container, right? And then we run into that second schedule and that gets put message number two, right? So that's, that's this business right here, this message number two. Then once we complete this, so let's say we get done with this part of the file, now we NeoVim basically checks the event loop and it says, oh, there's a new thing to run. So it tries running message number one. And when it gets there, it's going to run into this vim.schedule, right? This one right here. So what's it going to do? It's going to take the next 
available spot in the queue. And so it's gonna put something right in, or I guess I won't draw that arrow, let's draw maybe something like this. This basically puts a new spot in here that's this sort of like scheduled uh, squared or something like that, right? It's the scheduled inside of a schedule. So is that, I, I, I'm hoping that makes sense to everybody. And what, what you can see here is actually the scheduling is deterministic. This isn't like running in multiple different threads. What we have is one event loop that things are getting executed on. And it's very nice because you know in what order things are gonna get executed. And uh, you can sort of predict and make uh, deterministic, uh, I guess, not guesses since it's deterministic, <laughs> whatever the right word would be, deterministic logic, something like that, about what's going to happen with the next schedule. So that's sort of the general gist of what's going on with schedule. The one other thing to note that you you might often see is you may see schedule wrap. What does schedule wrap do? So we can make our own little schedule print and that can be vim.schedule wrap a function. And let's just go ahead and take this little guy right here. We'll put him back and then do this, right? So now we've got a scheduled print. So what does scheduled print do? This, instead of executing this contained function here, it will actually say schedule the function inside when I call this function. So it's a higher order function. So basically every time we call scheduled print, it's going to basically just be like writing vim.schedule this inner function. Okay, so if we run this again, we'll, and we check our messages, you'll see we call this scheduling in a scheduled function twice. But those don't run like asynchronously right there, just later happening on the event loop. So the only change in our picture would be that we just have another little scheduled spot right here and that gets executed later. So that's sort of the basic gist of what's going on with vim.schedule. So you probably have a question like, why would you want to do this? So the main case where you're going to be using this inside of NeoVim is the case where you do some stuff like you are in a place where certain functions are not available. Now you're like, TJ, okay, sure, that seems somewhat circular though. You're just saying, well, some stuff isn't available. Well, why isn't it available? That's a wonderful question, YouTube. I can answer that question for you. So let's say we have something like, we'll make a new uh, demo here and let's just do something like uh, attach demo, or just make a new attach. Um, and let's say we're going to do something like vim.api.nvimbuff attach. Now, if you don't know what this does, you can check out the help for it. But basically what it's going to do is whenever something changes inside of a buffer, it's going to call some callbacks to basically give you information about those changes. And this allows you to do things like on every character that's typed, it allows you to sort of determine if you want to do something based on those characters instead of sort of a complicated web of like auto commands and other things, this allows you to do that. So that's the first thing we can know and we'll just do a quick example here. So let's say we um, do this and we have some on lines function. And if we look at the documentation here, it'll tell us that on lines uh, gets basically the, uh, the string lines, which we don't need in this case, the buff number, which we don't really need, we don't need change ticked, and this is first line, last line, okay? So those are the um, functions that, or the parameters that we get inside of here. So we could do something like local lines is uh, vim.api.nvim buff get lines, which could just be like zero. And let's get this from the first line to the last line um, with false. So basically this, what this is going to do is it's just going to get us the lines that have been changed. Okay, and so what we can do is we can print.vim.inspect these lines. Okay, so basically this will just allow us to print those changes and we can see what's going on. I'm just going to do one little uh, thing here that you don't have to know a bunch about, but basically this is just a way for me to cancel this at any time that I want. So if uh, detach, uh, then return true. Okay, so this just basically lets me cancel the subscription without restarting the OVIM over and over. Okay, just ignore that for now. We're focusing on the other part, right? So if I run this file and I start typing, see how when I'm typing ABC here, I get ABC. Let's say I paste this line and now I move these here. I'll probably actually have two events here, which is that I get a new line and some other stuff here going on. 
that's okay. And then if I delete this and I say DEF, see how I keep on getting these new um, updates and I'm printing out what this line looks like. If I tried to do something like hit enter and then I do this again, we're gonna get more on lines updates. So that's, there's nothing too crazy about that, right? We're pretty much just printing the line that we're getting. So that's cool, but what if you wanted to do something, oh, I just uh, saved this file and so it does that. I can do detach um, equals true to cancel this. Now it won't be printing anything else. Cool. What if I want to do something interesting like and then get current uh, buff. So this buffer is uh, 1,164. So let's say uh, local buff number is 1,164. What if I wanted to do something like update this buffer with whatever the updated text is, which is maybe not exactly what you want to do, but it's just an interesting idea to sort of put these together. So instead of printing the lines, let's do vim.api and vim buff set lines, right? And we're going to set buff number uh, and we're just going to set all the uh, all the lines, so that's 0 to negative 1, to what the lines are. Okay, so this pretty much just means whatever I change, we're going to put that in this buffer. Now, now, something's going to happen here. I'm expecting the error, okay, YouTube, so I don't want to see any comments saying, TJ, you had an error at whatever this timestamp is. I know. I already know that, right? So we run this. Nothing happens yet because we haven't made any changes. But when I try and make a new line, I get this error here, not allowed here. So what does that mean? Effectively, what is happening is that in on lines, we are currently processing a change. Basically inside of NeoVim, right? We are uh, still evaluating the change and sort of getting the result of what should happen based on that change. We do not allow users to make changes while we are inside the place where we're making changes because that would be difficult and it leads to very weird interactions between different global state things that are part of Vim's code base. It's not, not a good situation that you want to be in, right? So instead we say is, whoa, 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 no, you can ask what the lines are, like a read-only lock, but you're not at a time right now where you can write to something. So if we change this instead to be something like vim.schedule wrap, this whole function, what's going to happen now? We're going to wait, uh, well not wait, this is going to schedule that function till somewhere later on the event loop when it is allowed to access all of NeoVim's APIs. So now if we run this and I start typing like this, notice how I typed ASDF and I got ASDF down here, right? And that's okay because the scheduling has, uh, has the event loop here only gets called when you're allowed to use these functions. That's sort of the whole point of vim.schedule wrap is we're allowing plugin authors to have a hook for when their code can be executed safely. But in fact, we actually don't even have to do this whole schedule wrap. We could do something a bit smaller where we might do an inline kind of thing here where we, uh, whoops, sorry, vim.schedule function. And, and let's actually just uh, set this to touch as true because I can't focus. We could actually just schedule this part only and get what is effectively um, the a closure around the things that we've gotten here. And then this is also safe to run. So you could schedule, for example, a more uh, you know, expensive computation or put these into a big list and, and only do this once every second via a timer or a bunch of different ideas that you could use to basically make each keystroke still feel fast, uh, but then allow yourself to do processing later, right? So it's not that it happens in a separate thread, right? It's all happening in the same place, but it can happen later in time at a time that might be better for the user. So if we run this code instead, you'll see that now as we're writing here, we're getting uh, this and there's no errors because we're scheduling only the part that's not allowed. So that's just a quick run through as quick as I could do for what is schedule, when you use schedule and schedule wrap and sort of why do we even have this concept at all inside of NeoVim. If you have questions, feel free to leave questions in the comments. So I can try and answer them in another video. Hope everybody has a great day. And as always, I love you all. And I'm, I just hope you're enjoying NeoVim. See ya.